Good morning to everybody who is joining us. We'll just wait uh, 30 seconds so before we uh, start. Different attendees are, are, are trickling in now. Um, we're waiting for one other of these speakers. So just we'll, we'll start in about 30 seconds. So <clears throat> good day to everybody, or uh, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, middle of the night, wherever you happen to be. Welcome for, uh, to you and, and, and thank you for joining us for this webinar, uh, Tired of Elections, Creating Momentum in the Face of Electoral Fatigue. This is the first event actually of over 40 that will be held today. Those 40 events are uh, organized in the context of the Global uh, Democracy Coalition Forum, 24-hour event uh, ahead of the Summit for Democracy, which will take place on the 9th and 10th of December, so Thursday and Friday of this week. This event is launched right now. Uh, um, it is designed to galvanize attention conversation about democracy ahead of the summit. You can tweet about it by using the hashtag democ uh, Global Democracy Coalition. There is also a website uh, of the same name, globaldemocracycoalition.org, where you can find out about the other events and you're very welcome to join those other events over the course of the next 24 hours. Now, for us, conscious of the fact that there will be many events today, we are organizing a rather different format, a conversation among eight participants. Now, those eight participants are, are experts in the area of uh, democracy support and elections. Uh, my name is Ken Godfrey. I'm the Executive Director of the European Partnership for Democracy. And these uh, conversation participants who are, who are here with us uh, today are also linked to EPD, either members or, or part of uh, a network with some of our members. Now, each of these participants, you're very free to all of you to jump in when you want in terms of the conversation. Um, uh, we have a series of four questions to structure the discussion. But if we veer off from those questions, then that's also okay. Now, we're here to discuss basically a, uh, the fact that there is a trend of autocratization across the world. And elections have been viewed, and I think are, a, an opportunity to arrest democratic uh, decay in many countries. They're viewed as an opportunity for change. At the same time, in other countries, they're also viewed as um, a barrier to change and people protest, they view elections as outdated, they don't have the right choices. And so here we're, we'd like to discuss that through those four questions. Those four questions are, what are the global trends in terms of elections? Why are elections still so important for democracy? Third, what are the most difficult um, areas of democracy support linked to elections? And finally, what steps can different actors, international, national, local, what steps can they take following elections? Uh, we want to mix analysis with practical suggestions. Uh, we may not all agree with each other at all times, but that's the point of us uh, being here with, uh, with you know, a wide variety of speakers. I'll just introduce all of them first, uh, to call, call out their names before we, before we begin. We have Tanya Holstein from the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. John Inge Lovdal from the Oslo Center, Michael Lauder from electionwatch.eu, sorry for butchering your surname, Michael, Matthias Pazbeck Skibdal, am I, yeah, I'm doing a good job there, from DIPD, the Danish Institute for Parties and Democracy, Domenico Tukinardi from the Edge Foundation, uh, Gary Klauke from Demo Finland, Nino Dolidze from the International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy. And finally, Michael Meyer Zende from Democracy Reporting International, who has not been able to join us yet. So <clears throat> I wanted well, just to let you know that there's a Q&A function. So you can uh, 
ask us some questions directly if you would like to through that Q&A function. Uh, we'll try to get to them, but we do have a, a conversation to start before then. So I wondered if anyone could uh, take the floor first, sort of, uh, uh, chip in with, uh, although Michael has now joined us, who's actually written about, uh, about this uh, before. So we, we, we'll, we'll begin now, I've given a sort of introduction, I hope that's clear to everybody here who's used to hear us in terms of the, these participants and speakers. So we'll start with our first question. What are the global trends in terms of elections? I wonder if somebody would take the floor. Michael, Michael uh, Merizende, you have written about this before. So please feel free to, to, to take the floor to, to kick us off, but also others, if you'd like to, uh, like to step in, then please do. Hi, Ken, good morning. I'm really sorry. I was in another meeting that took longer with a conference in Pakistan. If you would just choose one before me and then I come in that I organize myself for one second. No problem. Apologies. No, no, no worries. I hope the, the meeting in Pakistan went well. Uh, just others, <laughs> others uh, if there's somebody who'd like to come in, then please, please uh, do so. Domenico, please. Well, I mean, uh... Thanks for this invitation. Thanks for this provoking, thought-provoking title. You know, tired of elections. I, I think we, you know, we're all looking forward to hearing from Michael about the what the major challenges that he has written about. I mean, I think we we all feel the pressure in daily daily programs, daily assistance activities. However, I mean, if we accept the, I mean, I just want to start with a counter token. If we accept it, the, the premise that democracy remains a global aspiration with its multiple ways to present itself, to manifest itself, sometimes very perfectible, very improvable. Uh, it, it, does, uh, it does remain as the best known way to achieve global goals of uh, democracy, as freedom, equality, and probably to, uh, to facilitate sustainable development. If we accept this as a global premise, I think we need to acknowledge the need to remain engaged in the electoral support in general and uh, delve into the various challenges of it. I mean, to me, nothing like democracy, the event uh, provides uh, the litmus test for the status, uh, for the state of democracy in a given country. And I'm saying that after having spent the last 15 years promoting the concept of a process, of uh, looking at electoral assistance as uh, process-oriented uh, programming, not as event-oriented uh, activities. However, without the event, we would not have the process. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a think, check, yeah. a check yeah. on the system, yeah. how, how, the, yeah. how, the systems, how the system's doing, indeed. Yeah. Thanks, Maybe I'll stop there just to start there, to kick off the conversation. Very good, very good. Others? Michael, please, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, and thank you, Domenico, also for buying me some time here. Um, yeah, I just would make four points, not all uh, maybe completely joined up, but I think uh, what what I find interesting, we see in the last years, in the last 10 years, basically a very big increase of social unrest. So, you know, you have lots of trackers for that from Carnegie and from others. And they all say that there's a very tangible um, increase of social unrest all around the world. And I think it chimes in with, with the, you know, with the experience we have if we look around, there are lots of big demonstrations in many countries, et cetera. And at the same time, in exactly the same period, we have an ongoing decline of democracy. So this is somehow two movements that, that uh, is hard to explain if you want why on the one hand so much mobilization and on the other hand a steady decline in democracy and somehow for me the connection between the two has something to do with elections in the sense that all these protests all the social mobilization doesn't seem to achieve the institutional change that it's looking for and that is i think one big question to ask ourselves, why is there so much uh, mobilization that doesn't seem to achieve its objectives? And normally we would say, well, that's what our elections are for. And why don't, don't elections achieve that point? And I think that's something um, interesting to look at. So social mobilization that doesn't bring change 
And normally we would have thought social mobilization turns into, uh, you know, turns into certain election results that then engineer that change. So there is something that's not working in this connection. And uh, one element of that, I think one obvious explanation is of course the increasing authoritarian uh, wave around the world that makes sure that elections do not achieve that objective, basically that, that frees in um, ruling parties or ruling, ruling politicians. And then a second trend that I would just like to mention is, you know, I still read lots of articles that always say turnout is going down, turnout is going down. We are reading this for 50 years and it's a crisis of democracy talk, but it's not so true anymore. There are quite many countries where turnout is actually going upwards and not all of them for sure, but quite many. And again, I think it has to do with the societies being more politicized and also more polarized. And I wouldn't uh, consider all of that negative because polarization in some way is good for democracy that people feel there's a real choice and it makes a difference whether I vote for A and B. It only becomes pernicious when it gets extreme the way we have seen it in the US. Then of course, it's not any more positive polarization, but polarization, I think, seems to um, push turnout upwards. So that's maybe a little bit of good news um, um, on the election front. And the uh, um, third issue that I see, and it's maybe still quite weak, but I think it's worth mentioning when we talk about elections is the whole question of how we see election. And I do see interrogation of whether questions are actually a good um, institution of democracy and it's raised in softer or harder ways, I think from many people who are involved with um, the whole climate debate. And there are just many people there who feel democracy hadn't delivered enough on this emergency and it's not working. And there's also a line of thought that says traditional politics is just too much part of the carbon status quo and of very strong lobbies and that elections cannot break that. And many of these people give huge faith into citizen assemblies and feel that this is a much more authentic way of engaging with people. It's a much deeper way and it's a less corrupted way because you have no lobbies in the room basically. And I don't believe in this. I think citizen assemblies are really good innovation and very important. And um, I, I see why many people are, um, are very positive about them. I'm also positive about them, but I see them as a compliment. And then the last point, which is, is not a trend, is um, I think we as people who all support elections in many countries around the world um, feel that the challenge has become much more complex. 20 years ago, it was often a relatively technical challenge. Yeah, it's not working well. Election commissions have to know better how it works. Parties have to engage in a more, in a more effective way in elections and these kind of questions. And now we have additional challenges that are just many actors who try to um, convince you, convince the electorate that elections are um, you know, not worth it or that they are rigged. I mean, again, the United States, you have a losing party that says they are rigged. And we have to make decisions and we have to have opinions whether we think sometimes elections are rigged. So, but there's a much bigger ideological struggle, I think, around each elections. Um, whether you want to accept the process or you don't want to accept that process. And I think it turns into real detailed challenges again for our interlocutors and let's say election commissions, which have been a key um, uh, part of our interlocutors and institutions we try to support. And suddenly they have to work or address this wave of often disinformation on social media that tries to trash that institution, the election commission and tries to trash an election. And that's a totally new challenge. And that's not something we have dealt with in the past when we helped them to build better voter registers or a good election day process or the election appeals Some complaints in that context are very important. So I think in this field, like in all fields of democracy support, we have a new challenge, which is trying to roll back. And I think sometimes we have to think also about our theory of change. So if we are defending actually institution is a bit different from the traditional, we just support institutions to do a better job. So this is just some thoughts to kick us off. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, I think you very, 
aptly describe the sort of the, the dilemma that we're facing, the sort of the fact that many people feel as though elections are not working. So what can we do to sort of encourage or help those elections to better uh, address some of the challenges to, to the functioning of, of democracy? John, I have your hand up and then Matthias, please, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I, I just had one question to you uh, about trends because, <clears throat> and I'm not sure if, if I'm 100% if I'm correct in what I'm saying, but, but I think this is about throwing up uh, questions or, 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 or ideas and concerns. I mean, I think one, one, one thing that we also have seen, uh, maybe in, in, in some individual cases, but, but I think that um, uh, quite, quite a number is that while you have the election and you have might have high turnout, um, the the election result is somehow decided through more of a judicial process about political negotiations, um, having a, a, a political settlement after the election because you couldn't agree on on, on the election um, outcome or or the electoral process. So I'm also thinking about like. How, how does that kind of, what is the, what is the impact of, of, of those, if, if that's a trend or if it's just um, isolated cases uh, on how, how does that um, relate to, to, to election as that event or that part of, of, of democracy where people are really asked to come out and to decide who, who, who should represent them, who should talk on behalf of them. Uh, while we see that 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 maybe the, the the final result is 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 being being decided through the court system or through negotiations, um, does that mean that we also need to think a bit wider when it comes to to preparation? I mean, uh, I think we work with judiciary, but is it more important to to also work with with that section? Um, I mean, again, back to the whole the whole process thinking um, in the lead up to the election, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my question. Thanks, John. Uh, Michael, would you like to try to answer, or Matthias or Domenico, if you have um, reaction to that? Let's uh, give Michael the chance to answer first. Uh, yeah, I know we have many speakers, so I thought we go through and then we discuss together, but uh, I, I can um, just briefly come in on this. I think, John, I see, I mean, different stories. If we have elections that are decided by courts, that I would interrogate a bit. For me, this is the working of the rule of law and courts have the rights in most countries and rightly so to review an electoral process and see whether it was uh, correct or not. And we had the very obvious and high level ones in the US, you know, Georgia or something, endless appeals and all the courts said, no, 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 this was okay. And I think that's perfectly fine. And I think it's also fine for courts to say in some instances, sorry, there were too many problems here and they may have impacted the results and we have to rerun an election. And it doesn't mean that they decide the result, but they decide, they make a decision about the process. Here in Berlin, it's possible we have to rerun um, our last, uh, elections for, for Berlin because there were just lots of technical problems and that's perfectly okay. I think the court decides on that. The political settlement is a different issue and I think that we know of course from conflict countries and I think this is a much more complex subject. It's uh, where often our community who looks at electoral integrity then gets in a certain tension maybe with the peace building mediation and high level political uh, processes which say well we have to preserve the peace and we feel well but we can also encourage losers to pick up the gun and say i don't accept it let's now talk political agreement because i, I didn't like the results and i think that's a very fine line often and uh, very complicated but i to discuss it as a trend, I don't have enough data in my head now to say something about it. I think often it's a bit of case by case situation. Thanks, Michael. And it, <clears throat> this is this is the spirit. This is what we want: uh, engagement between people. So that's very that's very good. Matthias, you had your hand up first, and then uh, Domenico, then Nino, then Tanya. Please, Matthias. Thank you, and thank you, Michael, for for highlighting uh, a few of the uh, many challenges that we uh, I think all of us agree uh, that we are facing now. 
global, global democracy. Uh, I think uh, I just wanted to take the chance today to highlight one question, which I think is, is overarching for all of us. And that is what comes next and what happens now, because we all know the challenges. They are well documented by now. I'm a fairly young man still. I was born in 84, meaning I was seven years old when the Berlin Wall fell. Meaning, so throughout my entire adolescence and youth, I've seen democracy rise around the world. And we are now back to square one, uh, I feel. I mean, uh, the trust in politicians is an all time low. I, I'm living in Denmark, one of the most stable and representative democracies in the world. And the trust level in politicians at 15%. I mean, it's. <laughs> we usually say it's way below uh, used car salesmen. So, uh, so I think that's alarming. Uh, the members and political parties have left. I mean, there are no members left. The platform is gone. N political parties are no longer what they used to be, uh, especially in the Western part of the world. But the challenges are the same in many of the developing countries that we engage with. So what comes next? I mean, and I, I truly believe, even though I come from organizations, tend to focus more on on the time between elections instead of uh, the time during elections. I think, uh, you know, elections remain pivotal in, in, the, in the defense and development of, of uh, democracies. As you said, Michael, actually there are tendencies towards greater voter turnouts. People demand democracy. They demand different types of especially direct democracy involvement. You also mentioned citizen assemblies. Uh, there are uh, other ways of, of including the, the citizens more directly in the, in the democratic process. But people want to get involved. People demand democracy. They demand to get uh, their uh, vote uh, counted in, in a free and fair manner. So I think as a democracy supporting institution, of course, we should still focus on the elections. Of course, we should defend free, fair and transparent elections. But we should also work with the organizations that reach out to citizens or should uh, reach out to citizens uh, before, during and after elections, political parties, uh, election commissions, as you said, uh, John, uh, the juridical sector also to ensure that everything is, is, is free and fair and, and, and transparent. Uh, but, but I really think as, as we as organizations, because I'm also saying this, this you know, many of you have worked in this sector for, for way more years than, than I have. And unfortunately, all our uh, good efforts, uh, well, <laughs> we are not reaping the fruits at the moment. Uh, uh, and I, I truly believe that we should, we have to reevaluate how we engage in a different uh, area of the uh, era of democracy. So I also hope this uh, event today can be a sort of a starting point for this conversation, which is already going on in various forums uh, and where we try to revitalize our own uh, approach to elections uh, and to democracy support uh, in between elections. Indeed, thanks, uh, Matthias. Also, for pointing out that you know, this is a global. It's a global trend. It's a, it's within uh, <clears throat> European Union, outside of the European Union, around the, the neighbourhood of the uh, of the European Union, but also you know, pretty much all corners, all corners of of the world. Domenico. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think a lot of interesting points have been raised already on the reasons. Maybe on the point raised by, by I'm trying what to connect point raised by John to Michael on the say on the process and let's say the participation or the concurrence of other institutions in uh, altering or determining the outcome of an election. This it's probably it's probably true in many post conflict or. Uh, in many post-conflict situations or in countries where we have uh, we have uh, let's say authoritarian tendencies and developing and it's true that uh, many have looked many many also autocrats have learned how to look at the elections as a process themselves so they perfected themselves ways to how to sub how to maintain their grip and power through controlling other other institutions not just electoral management bodies Judiciary could be one, could be other other institutions that are part of the uh, part of the state that have an influence on the election. And the challenge then for uh, electoral systems, democracy systems in general, is how to move beyond the technical fix without forgetting the, the technical fix. The technical fix has probably a number of other uh, ramifications that we have not yet fully developed in, in the systems. I mean, how we how can how can one support 
national uh, electoral commissions in providing a better service during campaign or monitoring campaign in uh, uh, in uh, enforcing campaign rules and making sure that the adequate pensions have been paid or again how to improve uh, the support that they provide in the political party funding and now the monitoring political party funding, which is an, an entire new world and very complex for our electoral system. And again, how to improve communication between electoral commissions and political parties in general beyond the immediate, the, the, the close electoral period. So these are areas of possible assistance that are still very technical in a way. They still don't, um, they, they still, but they do provide a way to enter and uh, to enter into areas that are always gray and increase the transparency of the process and make it very difficult then for, um, for I would say, authoritarian regimes to not to disclose or to ignore what uh, what uh, what abuses of state resources in various ways could could mean. Thanks, Domenico, for those uh, concrete, uh, concrete areas to, to focus on. Nino, the, the floor is yours. You've been waiting patiently. Yes, uh, thank you very much. It's really very interesting discussion. And here uh, I wanted to answer the question of uh, John and also Domenico touched this uh, issues. So I'm coming from Georgia, and this is the country which has bucket of everything what we were talking here. And it's very interesting to share experience of, of Georgia and to refer to our question, people are tired or not of elections. And uh, I'm coming from the country where we have uh, elections almost every year. And uh, we can say that really, yes, people are tired of elections, but they are tired of elections, not because that we have elections every year, but unfortunately it's getting more and more difficult to make changes with elections every year. Uh, so whenever we are talking a lot election, about elections from different countries, it's very much important to consider elections which are conducted in these developing countries, democratic developing countries like Georgia, and uh, also to uh, think if election results really reflect the will of people. And here what I am talking is that uh, in Georgia, for example, uh, electoral system uh, doesn't really allow people uh, to reflect their will and because we have system which is mixture of for example proportional and majoritarian system uh, and uh, proportional wise people really do not support any, any political party to have more than 50 percent but unfortunately during our independence 30 years we are getting almost every time one party majority which brings Georgia uh, to have one party having all state institutions under, under control, including election administration, including the judiciary. So whenever we are talking about election results and whether there is trust or not, not trust with election results, it's very difficult to even, you know, appeal about election results because then you are get, going to the judiciary, which is also control of uh, under one party. So in Georgia, really, people are very much frustrated. And I do not say that there is one party who they want to support. But unfortunately, when you have parliamentary election where one party has, for example, even 48%, but not more than majority, they have almost constitutional majority in government, almost, I am saying, and they are ruling all the state institutions. So here I want to raise the role of uh, international stakeholder, stakeholders because this is one hour topic. Whenever uh, in country people do not have trust towards election administration, also trust towards state institutions. And if we look at polls, political parties have, have also very low uh, trust from citizens. Uh, here we can say that only hope in this country, like country like Georgia, is international stakeholders who are, for example, observing elections and then assessing our elections. And in this case, we are really much uh, looking what will be their assessments and what will be the recommendations and how they follow up on the recommendations. It is very much important. And uh, uh, recently we have been like um, uh, listening from our international friends uh, that assessments are kind of the same type, whether we have good elections or bad elections, you know, diplomatic language is always kind of balanced and they do not openly say. So uh, I think this is something we should be looking 
uh, for and asking for our inter international stakeholders because, for example, I am from domestic uh, observer group and like we always say very loudly what are the problems, but it is very important that our international partners like kind of echo and say very openly uh, because everybody, I mean, citizens of these people are looking what international observers say and citizens are looking and sometimes they, they are really frustrated because the, whatever we get assessment, uh, both sides and be, because we have this high polarization, they are interpreting how they want. So uh, I would raise this topic as a discussion. We have very good uh, example of EU, medi EU mediation process, which ended uh, last year political crisis, but still political parties are not responsible and accountable even to this agreement. Uh, and I think we should think about how to follow up on this assessment of international organizations and how to make governments who are not implementing uh, recommendations to be more accountable to these recommendations. This is question and like discussion topic, which we can also continue. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nina. Well, we have some people who are very well versed here in election observation. We've done it for, for many years. So it'd be, it'd be very interesting to hear from them in terms of that, uh, I guess, kind of critique of, of the fact that maybe they're not forthright enough sometimes in their, in their assessments. So, uh, I don't, Tanya, maybe you could even you could tackle that in you, what, you, what you'll say, because you're, you're next in line. But if others would like to come in on that, please also let me know. Tanya, please. Thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, I wanted to start just answering um, or saying something towards Michael's trends or the ones he identified uh, on the one on assemblies, uh, citizen assemblies. I concur with Michael on the fact that they are very important, but they're an add-on. I also... Oh, I am also of the opinion that institutions are the way forward because in institutions can be held accountable. Um, citizen assemblies, that's a very different uh, set of things. Um, and having said that, that they need to be held accountable. I think with the institution of the election management body, we are facing a, a huge problem of having this institution basically working in in vacuum in some of the cases. So you have electoral processes, donors look at electoral processes and they look at the election institution, which might be independent, might not be independent, which is one of the problems creating trust among citizens. Um, and the independence question is something that really needs to be looked at a little bit more, the de facto independence, which I need to say, because some of them are independent on paper. Uh, lots of them have it in the name and it's also a trick very often by governments to name them independent, but they're not. So the de facto independence is something we need to look at. And then having said that, in, in a second level, I mean, these institutions, when they do work, um, and also coming back to Michael and others, um, yes, they are the technical part of an election, but they're only one part. And if we look at the, um, the set of electoral integrity or the goal of electoral integrity, which we potentially try to approach at one point, um, then the technical assistance to election management bodies is one thing, but there is a whole other side of things which we tend not to look at uh, enough. It's the electoral environment of which the election management body is one part. Um, and there is parties, media, civil society, external actors, everything uh, which plays into a political process. And with this, we need to support the election commissions, their independence and their work and their interaction within this environment more so that we get away from this technical support. And then we could also include civil society much better and have them, as Michael lined out in the beginning, they mobilize, but nothing is changing. And then I'm coming to, to what Nino said, nothing is changing because at, first of all, the election commission is not always the center point for change. It's very often the parliament. And as we heard before as well, they might not want to do it because it's against their interests when they come to office. But then again, if we involve the whole electoral environment, then there is a broad coalition of groups and people to push for these different changes. So you don't have separate um, groups of citizens coming forward and be disappointed and frustrated at the end because they would work within a, a larger conglomerate of moving parts within a society. And that is something I think we, we should look at uh, and look into a little bit more. And coming there to the reform bit, um, if you do electoral reform, um, this is nothing that needs to be done only on a technical side. Electoral reform has to be inclusive and it's a long term process. And we, we did some research in WFD to see what would work and what would not work. And one important thing that came out of the research is that election um, recommendations are more often implemented where civil society is already organized and working. 
and uh, two specific topics, not all of the topics, of course. And we just need to harvest this a little bit more and put it throughout the electoral cycle, not only eight months prior or eight months before, but all the time support the election institution and their independence throughout the electoral cycle, as well as civil society, all the way through and do it in a consultative process to get away from this technical vacuum and just create something more on, on a governance, integrated governance support structure. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tanya. Really highlighting yeah, the, the, I guess the, the somehow the, the environment itself around the election and the fact that I think it, it builds on what was said earlier also by Domenico, the, 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 that process point, um, but also including these different actors. Uh, and now we have lots of hands up. So if there's anybody who's reacting to a point that somebody has just made, then please let me know or just unmute yourself and take the floor okay because there's lots it's a very rich discussion there's a lot there's a lot that we're that we're building on here next in line john please and then Gary, yeah, you're yeah just very 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 quickly because I, I i just want to 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 support what what tanya was was talking about uh, i mean it is i mean while while elections are technical it's it's basically a political process and um, and um, I think that 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 and then sometimes support and, and assistance to the elect to the election comes too late and and sometimes it's it's hard to say this as a, as an implementing partner but sometimes also too much money uh, too late um, so so uh, I think that that the focus more on on the political environment and I think that and then and then to build trust and I I, I agree with what what, what Dominico was saying about like code of conduct, uh, all, all of that aspect. But of course, that needs to, to start much, much early. Uh, and you need to have um, um, stakeholders engaged in that process of developing those code of conduct to create the ownership. And then I think that there is also one element that we often don't talk too much about. We talk about political parties, but we don't talk about the candidates because the candidates Often run their often run their own life uh, during the during the campaign period, uh, which might not be so much linked to the party. And then finally, I think there is also another element that we haven't touched upon, and that's corruption, uh, which of course is is a big big topic in, in in all of this, and and the money involved in politics, the money involved in, in what Nino was was somehow referring to. So I think that that that's my comment on, on this. But this it's about the politics that it's it is a process. It's 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 the whole kind of environment where where election is part of it is an important part of it. There were important actors, but if we forget the rest, uh, we might also then have challenges related to uh, election as an event. And I think that's the basic, the bottom line of what we are discussing, which I think is very important. Thank you very much, John. I think uh, Michael, you also unmuted yourself because you were coming in in response to the previous point. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct, but I'm happy uh, to, to give Gary the floor. He had his hand up earlier and then I come in. Whichever way works, works best. Um, yeah, perhaps I can briefly say, uh, Matthias referred to uh, the optimism of the 1990s. I also was born in 1984 and, and I remember the, the heydays of the 90s when you know history was over and, uh, and democracy was was a done done deal, but uh, but indeed it's important to look at the current context where the challenges are are enormous. And and I think as a as a community of practice, we've got quite far in indeed having identified the issues and and having come come up with uh, with concrete solutions. And this week, indeed, uh, with the summit coming up, uh, is about finding those kinds of solutions. Um, I wanted to bring in the perspective of political parties now. Uh, democracy and elections are very sort of big concepts and uh, but, but you can't have them without these individual elements and political parties are, are an absolutely crucial one in that um, they are the ones who select candidates and then field them uh, to the elections um, there is the lack of trust which has been a global trend for quite some time and political parties i feel uh, are in a very very critical position in in so many countries where the membership has declined, there is the lack of trust, and parties themselves themselves have to be able to find ways to reform and to get particularly the younger generations to join in again. 
uh, a, a term that a British politician used with me some time ago was that we're, in, we're living in an age of an a la carte democracy, where it's easier, people feel more comfortable picking a, a single issue and, and, and going with that. And I understand that because signing up to a political party, signing up to a platform where you not, might not agree with all elements of it can feel quite, quite daunting. Uh, but at the same time, you can't run elections party. You can't run a democracy just through these single issue organizations. Parties have an absolutely vital role in that. Um, uh, Michael mentioned in his introductory speech a polarization, and, and I found it very interesting. There was the concept of good polariz polarization and extreme polarization. And indeed, good polarization ensures that politics doesn't get boring. It's important to have a robust discussion um on a national stage an international stage about a variety of issues but of course we've seen particularly in europe uh the effects of more extreme uh, polarization and that's where uh, the concept of political dialogue uh, comes in and at demo we we work quite closely on that both internationally and in finland um and, and political party dialogue is not just restricted to within parliament it's 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 more uh, it's it's about the parties having an understanding of the shared space uh, and, and, and having a common understanding of what issues um, are, are, are there to be discussed. Um, so, so I'll keep my remarks at that, just to highlight the, the critical role of parties in, in all of this. Thank you, Gary. Michael, please. Yeah, thank you, Ken, and uh, thanks uh, to all for, for the contributions. I'd like to uh, uh, connect to what Tanya was saying before and speak a little bit about how we may uh, come up with initiatives to fill the longer electoral cycle, but also how to tie together various stakeholders, EMBs, election management bodies, political parties, as just mentioned, the media and so forth. And to that purpose, I'd like to uh, share the example of what we did in Austria um, over the last couple of years as uh, a group of international election observers and, and experts who ha actually have come back home and, and see uh, and discussed what what can we do in our in our own country and what can we do inside the European Union to actually bring our our expertise to bear. And so when when we started this at home, so to speak, to be honest, in the beginning there was not much interest. Yeah, uh, because in a European democracy like Austria, ten years ago they thought, well, what what do you want? But a few years later, in 2016, we actually had uh, a, a significant electoral crisis situation where the entire presidential election was cancelled uh, and the repeat round had to be repeated twice due to administrative inconsistencies and technical errors. And suddenly there was space to speak and we came back to the stakeholders. And in this course, we spoke to constitutional lawyers. We spoke to uh, all parties represented in parliament. We spoke to the election management bodies at various levels. And finally, uh, of course, we, we, we met OSCE ODIR as international observer organization visiting Austria every now and then and established uh, a discussion. So apart from working with first time voters in schools in Austria, uh, voters are allowed to vote from the age of 16. And apart from uh, getting engaged academically as well, we uh, developed activities with the, uh, with the parliament. And we actually initiated a discussion of uh, uh, electoral reforms and re electoral reform issues together with the constitutional speakers of all political parties, which was held first. Uh, uh, three years ago, and which uh, caused uh, uh, more debates after an election. Yeah. So the the point here is that we actually we built on our own recommendations. We built on the recommendations that were provided by OSCEU Dear for Austria for a number of years. We summarized them. We presented them back to Parliament, to the parties, and OSCEU Dear and the election management body were invited as well to keep the ball rolling and to continue. Uh, this uh, discussion. And we think this was very fruitful. Uh, the next governmental agreement actually had a chapter on electoral reforms in it. And as you currently see, electoral politics in, in Austria keep being quite dynamic. So we stay on the ball and we will actually have the next uh, electoral reform uh, discussion in the Austrian parliament uh, next Friday, during which we will also present uh, an academic study that we have engaged uh, with uh, together with the University of Vienna, where we conducted a study on poll workers. So we, 
we looked at a very concrete issue that is very tangible to the public and see how do poll workers uh, uh, relate to their service, their performance, how could it potentially be improved, building on the situation that the political parties who nominate the poll workers are actually running out uh, uh, of people potentially in the future. So we conducted a survey among 1,000 poll workers, uh, prepared it for an academic journal, and the results of which will also be presented in the Austrian parliament next Friday. So these are just a few examples of what we try to do uh, in Austria. We have also tried to bring our attention back to the European level with the election watch EU election assessment of the 2019 uh, European elections. And there we were also invited and are being invited continuously to present our, our findings as civil society to the European Commission and the European Parliament. I may speak more about that later, but I want to give the floor to others. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And highlighting basically yeah, how to go about ensuring that there are reforms, which is one of the main challenges that we've brought up a number of different times. It's also come up in the Q&A of how to ensure that there are reforms if there isn't uh, a political will for those reforms to be enacted. And just, an after, just as yeah, an sorry. afterword to this, Ken, uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, just as an afterword, just to say, you know, at a discussion event on electoral reforms that is open to the public between civil society and, and parliamentarians, you know, in the Austrian parliament wouldn't have happened by itself. So yeah. it really needs initiative to get these things together. You need to contact the respective parties. You need to be in touch with the EMB and the authorities. You need to be in touch with ODIR to actually incentivize return visits and, and keep up the momentum uh, of discussions between international bodies and national bodies, yeah, uh, where where this would not have happened under circumstances where where other countries may have been of higher priorities. So, but but by by tying these links and being persistent in this in this course, uh, we actually believe there can be there can be made a difference. Great, yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, Domenico, I think you're next, and then Tanya. Yes, uh, I think this, what, uh, when Michael just presented about the Michael about uh, the activity selection watch, uh, respond a number of questions starting from Nina's interrogation, what happens with recommendations uh, provided by observers, and how this is uh, a much uh, richer and complex process, electoral reform, as Daniel was mentioning, that somehow needs to be nurtured internally. Uh, the recommendation of observers uh, can remain just um, on paper if they're not uh, filtered through a process of ownership and uh, national uh, national uh, national uh, appropriation, I would call it. And this is just what you know a wonderful a wonderful case that can be replicated, but also to explains the complexity and the various elements that need to be there. Uh, the international presence, uh, good recommendations. A national civil society with enough expertise to connect the various dogs at the parliamentary level and with other institutions and engage in the process. And this, in a way, this is the sense of what UNIPD is trying to provide and uh, in what you can will uh, hopefully will, uh, will master and, uh, and, and channel very, very soon in, this, in, in, our, in our study that is coming up very soon. And, how to how this how how this can be further um, uh, spread on a more on a global scale a lot depends a lot depends on how um, uh, observers recommendations are then uh, analyzed and uh, discussed by national groups in the post electoral period and um, a lot depends as well on what the recommendation tells us I think your uh, our study will tell us a lot on what recommendations tell us about the about electoral processes. You know, I believe that recommendation uh, mm, related to technical improvements don't, don't, don't probably concern more than 35, maybe 40 percent of what recommendations are about. Much of the other, much of the, of the rest, maybe 50 percent if we include the judiciary into this, into this, into this part. But what about the other 50 percent? I think uh, the enabling environment, the equitable access to media, disinformation operations, abuse of state resources are what makes a lot of uh, 
the, make up a lot of the of, of the demands. And these are not something that can be addressed with classical electoral assistance, but it has to be much more uh, wide in scope and in, in time. Yeah, the, so you've referenced this, a study that we we've done. It it kind of it also echoes. I think Tanya, you said, you said this from the Westminster Foundation study of the fact that you know civil society helps in terms of the implementation of certain recommendations. Our one very much does point to what you said, Domenico, that many of the recommendations are inherently political, and because they are inherently political, technical solutions are not going to work, and because those technical solutions not going to work, there needs to be more of the type of stuff that Michael has just presented, I'm sure that, that Nino's uh, organization does in Georgia, you know, the, that type of work that I think it's mentioned in the questions as well, that constant observation or constant engagement that doesn't come just at the, the moment. But this has been said for a number of years. I think that the analysis underlines that this is very true, that people's kind of inclination or uh, intuition is is correct that this is indeed a very massive challenge for ensuring that there is momentum for for reforms afterwards but i i don't know tanya if you've got something else to add on this point or if it's another point but please go ahead yeah thanks ken yeah i just to reiterate was uh dominic was just saying yeah it's true i mean we looked at a in a study and up to five african countries and basically collected 1,300 recommendations and logged them. And out of them, there were 40% of these recommendations not addressed to actors. So they were floating in the room and nobody was really addressing them in any way. And also what Domenico said, out of them, the 40%, one third of it was addressed technical to election commission. And they had a high level of, um, of implementation, like 43%, which is high. Parliament only had 30 and they have much more resources at their hands than the election commission would have. So there is a disparity um, in all of that. But one thing I wanted to mention is another thing we see at the end, or also we saw in the research, when people get the recommendations, lots of them are, and I would like to use Domenico's term, um, are on the democracy gap level. They, they're very high recommendations. They're basically goals and end goals of things to look at. Uh, like change of the media law, but there's a long way towards that. And that is never anywhere mentioned. And it's very difficult for people to pick them up and to, to look at them. And, and we, we're trying right now to develop something which is looking from the macro to the micro approach and have smaller recommendations be developed specifically for areas where recommendations are not implemented like political participation of women and political party campaign finance because they hit on power structures. These are very often just left alone and they need to be addressed in a smaller level and then have an incremental process within society, within the environment to actually come to the end goal. And this is not gonna happen in one electoral cycle. And that's another thing donors also need to understand. This is not happening very fast. This is a change in society, potentially behavioral change in society on some levels as well. And that needs to be fostered over a much longer term. Thanks. Thank you, Tanya. I, the, the, I have the statistics actually here, Domenico, of the, what, what you referenced. So 33% of EU electoral observation mission recommendations concern the electoral management body and 44, so more, concern the political environment and political competition. So you can see that that is very often an area that is a central area of focus because it is, as we've said, it's one of the great challenges. I think there's also questions in here about um, uh, technologies, new technologies, the impact on elections. Uh, there are also some questions about uh, uh, reform, particularly in uh, in Africa, Malawi, Kenya, that we have. Michael, you have your um, hand up again, please. Yeah, I'd just uh, really like to connect to what was just said again. And uh, when Tanya was mentioning the smaller scale recommendations, the, 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 the issues that to, to pin to pin the attention on where it really hurts, and I just want to say, you know, these 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 issues they don't stop outside the European Union. Like although this study was conducted in, in on African examples, but similar issues may occur inside the European Union and at European level. So this is why we we, we try to to mobilize election observer expertise in Europe to for the first time observe European elections comprehensively for the first time uh, civil society based in 2019 and plan to do that again in 2024. And what we found that there was great interest on the side of European decision makers to actually get this perspective, to get this civil society slash expert uh, perspective 
uh, on, on electoral processes. Polling stations may not necessarily be observed in this context. It, it may be relevant in some countries uh, in the European Union and less so in others. But there are growing areas of, of regulation, growing areas of, of social dynamics that relate to electoral systems across the European Union that we need to address, including, as was mentioned, social media regulation, including the, the pending issue of electoral participation of persons with disabilities, which is very ununiformly addressed across the European Union, and the list could continue. So uh, we did this as an election assessment kind of report, but nevertheless being able of taking a deep dive and, and, and providing recommendations that also serve as, as material and baseline uh, 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 for further discussions in the European Parliament and, and uh, other uh, European stakeholders. And uh, we will be very happy to continue these debates, not only within EPD, but also uh, with everybody else who's listening. Very good. Thank you, Michael. I have Nino on uh, 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 disinformation and maybe work in Georgia. We have five minutes left, a bit under five minutes. So, so Nino, please uh, take the floor and then yeah. I'll turn to Domenico. Yeah, I just, want, I just wanted not to leave the questions which are here mentioned in the chat that uh, really disinformation and propaganda is a uh, kind of a threat to, the, uh, to elections, but also it, it might be opportunity as well to use all these tools. That question was from Armin. Uh, Georgia is uh, like on the fifth place uh, in the world about inauthentic coordinated behavior. And we have very high level of uh, disinformation, propaganda and information manipulation which is related to elections mostly. And unfortunately, it's not only foreign uh, disinformation, but we have homegrown. Uh, and what we do just to share experience because it was asked these questions. One, uh, we are kind of trying to debunk, uh, debunk this disinformation, disinformation, which is related to political parties. We also very closely co cooperate with Facebook itself. And when we have these uh, fake accounts and coordinated behavior, we are trying to inform Facebook, which is taking down on this uh, uh, like uh, this information and propaganda and also the, we have cases of uh, having media literacy trainings workshop working with media in order to like spread what is uh, this information and in, the, in order to give to people information how bad it is how it undermines democratic institutions so we really think that the disinformation and propaganda is one of the threats which is coming more and more and it will be our future threat for elections and to, in general about democratic processes i will not continue i know that we are short sort of time so thank you but thanks nina indeed highlighting sort of the double dual approach of trying to attack the supply and then trying to uh, understand the sort of demand or the the, the citizen side of uh, of disinformation i think uh john first and then domenico and if there's anybody else who'd like to take the floor please you have to speak up now john please yeah, very quickly, because there was one question about youth and, and youth engagement. Um, and uh, I'm sorry that, that, that we are coming to that issue maybe when we have one minute left. So I, I, I think I would just uh, ask um, uh, or, or maybe request that, that now we have tried a global conversation about elections. I think that we could also try to have a similar on youth and, and democracy. Uh, because I think that some of the topics that we are discussing um, is very much related to the challenge of getting youth engaged. Uh, but I think that there is also a need to discuss uh, various strategies, opportunities and, um, and uh, experiences from all, all over the globe uh, on that topic. So that was what I wanted to say at the end. Very good, very well noted. John, Domenico. Yes, very briefly, and thanking you for this opportunity. I think so much has been already said and, put, and so much grill, so much made on the grill at the moment. You mentioned as well technology as uh, an increasing challenge, as an increasing challenge or problem. Yeah, the way I will uh, decline this is that uh, technological uh, improvements or in the new applications in electoral process permeate basically now every single aspect of the electoral process and not single from, from voter registration, from voter education to candidate registration, now even to uh, even observers applications, all done through electoral uh, technological means. So what we are witnessing now as a challenge is also that um, 
an increased sophistication ability from national stakeholders to use technology means and less technical proficiency from assistance providers. That's also a challenge that we need to, to look at. And I'll stop there because time short. Thank you all for this great discussion. Thanks very much, Domenico. And thanks to everybody who joined us. Lots of messages to take from this. I think it's, a, it's an interesting practice also for us to have this engagement. I really, I personally, I prefer this to something that's a panel of 10 speakers with 10 minutes, et cetera, to get, get people engaged and replying to each other. But I just say, I think there's a few takeaways. One of those takeaways is that we, you know, as a collective, you know, we do need to do a better job as a, those who are sort of pro-democracy advocates, as well as working on the issue of trying to use democracy uh, elections to reinforce democratic processes more widely. That can involve more participatory methods. It can involve better engagement of coalitions that push for change. But there, there are many different ways in order to do that. And there are ways that we, you know, as a collective, we need to think about. And there are also, and I think this is important, there are also technical elements that can be improved that build on this. So that they shouldn't be just technical on their own. They should marry that technical side with a more uh, political. And that includes in terms of technologies. It also in includes areas of the codes of conduct that were mentioned before, commu better communication between different actors. So there's this whole scope of work and we will be continuing on that. For all of you who, who have joined, uh, please, I, I reiterate that there's the, the website, uh, globaldemocracycoalition.org, where you can see some of the other events. There's some really interesting ones over the course of the day. Don't try to join all of them. That is physically and humanly impossible. But please pick the ones that you're particularly interested in. And thank you very much to all of the uh, speakers uh, with us today. And thank you very much to everyone that joined us. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Ken. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.